Tonight on Reporting Scotland, hundreds of people chant Islamist slogans at an event to honour the killer of Glasgow shopkeeper Assad Shah. We are proud of the fact that he has killed and we stand with him. We have an exclusive report from our correspondent in Pakistan. Also on the programme, a man has been arrested in connection with the disappearance of Scots airman Corey McCaig. Scotland's councils are spending millions importing food for school meals from thousands of miles away. A report shows fewer women in Scotland are terminating pregnancies following a Down syndrome diagnosis. And... I'm on the banks of Loch Lomond as new restrictions come into force on wild camping in this Scotland's biggest national park. Hello there, good evening. Hundreds of people have attended an event in Pakistan held in honour of the killer of Glasgow shopkeeper Assad Shah. Crowds chanting sectarian and Islamist slogans gathered at the family home of Tanvir Ahmed in the city of Mirpur on Monday. Ahmed is serving a life sentence for the murder of Mr Shah, whom he claimed had insulted the Prophet Muhammad in videos posted on social media. But as our Pakistan correspondent Sekunder Karmani reports, he continues to inspire extremists in his home country. Outside the family home of Tanvir Ahmed in the city of Mirpur, a 400-odd strong crowd is shouting slogans praising him. But he's not here. He's in jail in Scotland. Last year, he killed Glasgow shopkeeper Assad Shah, who is from the persecuted Ahmadi sect. He believed Shah was committing blasphemy by claiming in online videos to be a prophet. For many here, though, that killing was justified, and they see Tanvir Ahmed as a hero. Before, nobody knew who he was. Now, after what he did, God has made him so famous that the whole of Pakistan and even people abroad have heard of him. This gathering has been organized by a hardline but popular Pakistani cleric, Kadim Rizvi, who leads an anti blasphemy movement in Pakistan. But he's not here either, he's under house arrest. We met Rizvi at another rally earlier this month where he got a rapturous welcome. The chanting prophet of God, I am here. It's become the rallying cry of the anti-blasphemy movement, but it's also the slogan Tanvir Ahmed shouted defiantly in a court in Scotland as he was sentenced. Rizvi's social media pages heavily promote Tanvir Ahmed and have even released audio messages sent by him from inside jail. Like this one, where he says the penalty for blasphemy is death. Rizvi says he's been speaking to Tanvir Ahmed on the phone from jail every couple of weeks. We are proud of the fact that he has killed and we stand with him. I'm proud of the fact that we are in contact. But lots of Muslims would say one of the central characteristics of the Prophet was to show forgiveness and that he forgave people who insulted him. Even if the Prophet forgave someone, that was because it was his personal right to do so. But his followers don't have that right to forgive someone who's insulted him. The Scottish prison service has now put a stop to Tanvir Ahmed's audio messages, but Rizvi says his reputation in Pakistan will continue to grow. In Assad Shah's mosque in Glasgow, there's real concern about support for his killing. Pakistan has got the problem, there is no doubt about it. And this problem is uh, being even exported to outside Pakistan. Uh, the event which happened in Glasgow is uh, also an example of the same. Tanvir Ahmed's crime was carried out in Britain, but was inspired by ideas from Pakistan. Now it seems it's his turn to inspire others. Sikandar Kamani. BBC Reporting Scotland, Islamabad.
Police in Suffolk investigating the disappearance of Scots airman Cory McCaig have arrested a man on suspicion of attempting to pervert the course of justice. He was later released on bail. It comes as officers prepare to search a landfill site in their search for Mr McCaig who was based at RAF Honington. Alex Dunlop reports from the landfill site at Milton near Cambridge. Suffolk police are giving few details except to say they arrested a 26-year-old man this morning. Now they're interviewing him on suspicion of attempting to pervert the course of justice relating, they say, to information provided to the investigation. Significantly, perhaps, he's the first, the only person to be arrested since Corey McCaig went missing from the market town of Bury St Edmunds five months ago. The 23-year-old airman from Fife is stationed at an RAF base near Bury. He was last picked up on CCTV in the town centre after a night out with friends on the 24th of September. Now, police say that the arrested man is not the driver of a bin lorry which delivered refuse to this massive landfill site near Cambridge. It had collected a bin from the area where Mr McCaig was last seen. The fear is that he may have fallen into or have been placed in one of these commercial bins in this car park behind some shops. Well, police accept there's a real chance that Corey McCaig has died and that his body may be buried somewhere in this vast landfill behind me. What's happening now is they're making the site safe for officers to start their search. That'll happen in the next seven days or so. It'll be a grim task and one that will take several weeks. Alex Dunlop reporting Scotland in Cambridgeshire. MSPs have been hearing how a school support worker who wanted to find out about Asperger's syndrome so they could help a child was told to watch an American comedy programme. The claim was made to a committee investigating whether children with additional support needs are getting the help they need. There's concern the quality of provision and staff training varies across the country. Here's our education correspondent, Jamie McIver. One. Park Hill School in Glasgow helps youngsters who need some additional support. Just take a lovely browser on the room. It's showing off new facilities. This replica of a hotel bedroom is for courses which could lead to jobs in the hospitality industry. All the pupils here have faced real challenges which make learning harder. What would you like to do once you leave school? I'd like to hopefully work in the Hilton and from there I would like to become manager. The presumption nowadays is for youngsters with additional support needs to remain in mainstream schools. But for some, the better option is a specialist facility like this one. MSPs are examining the whole issue, and they heard from one parent whose child had a difficult experience in a mainstream school. My son, who was in primary six, played with the primary twos which then left the primary sixes making fun of him for playing with the primary twos. He's now in a class where there are mixed ages, mixed abilities. He gets on great. He has a peer group. Almost a quarter of children need some additional support. The phrase covers everything from serious physical handicaps to coping with bullying or bereavement. One real concern is training. It was even claimed one support worker was told to watch this TV comedy to find out about a form of autism. Well, in just this once, you can count me as people too. <laughs> Recently I was in a school and I asked a member of staff who was working specifically with a child with Asperger's, what training have you had in Asperger's? Or oh, I was told to watch The Big Bang Theory. Um, that, that's the level of training that we've got now in schools. And some teachers have worries about whether the right help is always available. Lack of training, uh, lack of resources, and again, that's down to, obviously, budget cuts. Our school, see an education psychologist once a month for two hours if we're lucky, that's not good enough. Few would say it's wrong in principle to try to keep children in the regular local school. Youngsters like the students at Park Hill are the exception, not the rule. But nationally, there are big questions over how things sometimes work out. Jamie McIver, reporting Scotland. The Scottish Government's plans to abolish the Scottish Funding Council Board have suffered a setback after MSPs voted against their proposals. It's yet another defeat for the SNP, who are a minority government at Holyrood. Ministers want to boost economic growth and are streamlining the four enterprise agencies, putting them under a single national board. The Conservatives who led the debate said it would put university autonomy under threat and smacked of centralisation. 
There was another flyby incident last night when an emergency was sounded for the touchdown of a flight at Edinburgh Airport. It was later described as a technical alert with a safe landing and no harm done. But it follows a crash landing on an Edinburgh to Schiphol flight last week when the landing gear collapsed. On the same day, a flyby pilot had to shut down an engine mid-flight, just as another one did a month before. The new chief executive of Flyby was in Edinburgh today facing the question, are your aircraft safe? <laughs> Safety is our top priority and uh, what you're describing events that happened the last uh, days, you know, our pilots uh, have been following uh, the procedures and they have been trained in our training academy to follow exactly the same procedures and we have been organizing, you know, the events in full coordination with uh, uh, the aviation authorities and all the airport authorities who have been uh, helping and supporting us in this type of situation. Scottish councils are importing school food from thousands of miles away, food which could be produced in the UK. Figures obtained by the BBC show that last year they spent £1.3 million on chicken from Thailand, more than 125000 on carrots from Belgium and 125000 on potato products from France. Our political correspondent Lucy Adams has this exclusive report. Any tomato and basil pasta, okay, please. Sweetheart. In this school in East Ayrshire, almost all the food is sourced from within a 30-mile radius. Eggs come from Mocklin, fish from Ayr and cheese from the Isle of Arran. I quite like local food because it's just better if, because you don't know what's in the food if it's coming from like abroad. I like knowing where my food comes from and I know all of this comes locally. But the schools here are some of the only ones in the country buying almost all their produce in Scotland. It's a matter of scale. Imagine each of my steps is six miles. Some schools are sourcing food as locally as 15 miles away. That's two and a half steps to your chicken. But most go much further for certain products. Schools are getting carrots from 500 miles away in Belgium mashed potato from 550 miles away in France and raspberries from 1300 miles away in Serbia. But most of Scotland's councils are going a lot, lot further for one particular product. Last year, they spent more than a million pounds on chicken from Thailand, 6,000 miles away. That's a thousand steps from where we started. One MSP has made it his personal mission to find out where Scotland's food is coming from. The quality of food that we are serving to patients in hospital, to our, to our kids in schools, is, is not the highest quality possible. And the thing is, when we look at some of the districts, some of the councils, for example, East Ayrshire Council, they can tell you, you know, where, which farm the eggs came from. So it's perfectly possible to procure locally, and it must be good for Scotland as a whole. Councils say they're trying to buy local. Their milk, yoghurt and much of their red meat is now from the UK. And their procurement agency says all the chicken in schools is high quality, but sourcing it in Scotland has proved difficult. Ministers say they're working to bring together suppliers and farmers to ensure more food is made in Scotland. Well, I think we're doing quite well, but we can do better. Almost half of the 150 million uh, spent on procuring uh, food in the, in the public sector is, uh, is uh, sourced locally. 48% is Scottish food. But why does it matter where our children's food comes from? You know your suppliers, you've talked to them on phone by name. The quality of the food is so much better. Um, you can see it, you can smell it, you can taste it. Despite ministers repeatedly calling for supermarkets, councils and shops to buy local, taxpayers' money is still being spent on food from thousands of miles away. Food which could be produced here. Lucy Adams, Reporting Scotland. New bylaws come into force today which will restrict camping around Loch Lomond and the Trossachs. From now until September, anyone who wants to camp in parts of the National Park will need to apply for a permit or stay in an official campsite. It's all part of an attempt to clamp down on antisocial behaviour and littering, as James Shaw reports. Loch Lomond, the largest inland body of water in Britain, drawing in millions of visitors every year. Without doubt, 
one of the jewels in the crown of Scotland's natural heritage. These pictures, holiday snaps from hell, you might call them, record the damage that has been done in previous years. So this whole swathe of woodland is Atlantic oakwood and it's designated as a very special species of oak. Which is why the Park Authority wants to bring in bylaws which will control wild camping in the busiest areas. In some summers, up to about 700 tents in these areas, the point of these bylaws is that number is unsustainable in these places. Um, the sheer number, the sheer impact of people toileting, littering and everything else is not sustainable for the environment. So we aren't trying to meet that demand because it isn't appropriate to do so. So from today, anyone wild camping in managed areas along the shores of the most popular lochs could face a fine of £500 and a criminal record. Between March and September, wild campers must purchase a permit for use in special areas. Wild camping enthusiasts see that as a breach of Scotland's legal right to roam. They believe the park authority should focus on educating people about respecting the countryside. There are things that the rangers and the authorities can do to clamp down on this. They already can fine people for littering, for antisocial behaviour. There's no need to create this bylaw which criminalises people who aren't doing it the wrong way. And let's be honest, it is a very small number of people and we're almost letting them win. And with the new restrictions, there could be a lot of disappointed campers this summer. The idea of Scotland when I first came here was that you could camp anywhere, no matter where you are. Just say that that's the law and you can camp. You come up here for the, 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 the fact that it's untainted and you can go wherever you want, whenever you want. That's what, you, that's what people come to Scotland for. If it's in a designated area, they can still come, they can still camp, they can still enjoy it, but everyone else can enjoy it as well. Um, people come in with kids, animals, and there's not all the rubbish left. This is the only location on the east side of Loch Lomond where wild camping is going to be permitted. The question is, will people know about these new controls and how strictly are they going to be enforced? The new bylaws will be reviewed in three years. So for the wild campers, this is a fight which is not over yet. James Shaw, Reporting Scotland on the banks of Loch Lomond. You're watching BBC Reporting Scotland. It's coming up to a quarter to seven. A reminder of tonight's top story. Hundreds of people chant Islamist slogans at an event to honour the killer of Glasgow shopkeeper Assad Shah. And still to come, many young people believe having a mental health problem will affect their life chances, a survey finds. There's been a 12% fall in the termination rate of pregnancies with a Down syndrome diagnosis. Glasgow University researchers also found expectant mothers in Scotland are more likely to continue these pregnancies than those south of the border. Morag Kinnebra reports. Let's go. Daniel is home from high school. God, here's pancakes. <gasps> pancakes! Oh, Dan, they look delicious. Can we have? At 14, he already has yes, plans for the future. I want a job. I'm um, office, hospital, and <laughs> my dad to work. In Scotland, over 50 children a year are born with Down syndrome. It's often a struggle for support. We're having a battle now getting him starting transitioning into the adult services, and that's, that's actually becoming quite an issue at the moment. And um, we're having difficulties trying to get a social worker for him because there's not very many in the area. With better testing, more women can find out if they have a chance of a baby with Down syndrome. The termination rate for these pregnancies in Scotland has dropped 12%. In Scotland, um, the, the proportion of women who decided to terminate a pregnancy following a diagnosis of Down syndrome had declined significantly. The studies sparked debate among experts. We would welcome the report. However, from our membership, we still hear that in today, in 2017, that families aren't always given unbiased and up-to-date information. Therefore, we remain our call on all health professionals to be appropriately trained so that they're able to give families up-to-date and accurate information about the life chances and capabilities of people with Down syndrome. It's me. Since Daniel was born, medical advances and improved services have increased options for people living with Down syndrome. 
I didn't think I'd be able to cope with him at all. And actually, he's made me a much better person for, for being his mum. Morag Kinnebrat reporting Scotland, East Lothian. A police dog handler has been left critically injured after his van was involved in a crash with a car on the A90 in Aberdeenshire late last night. The crash happened between Ellen and Peter Head. The 46-year-old officer was in a critical condition, while the 58-year-old male car driver was stable. Police Scotland said two police dogs in the van survived. Will a mental health problem stop you getting a job or getting on in life? Over half of 16 to 25 year olds surveyed for a new report say yes. Our reporter Suzanne Allen went to meet one woman who wants to help end the stigma about mental ill health. It's one of the grandest stores in Glasgow. Alana Briggs never thought she would work in a place like this. Two years ago she hurt her back, then lost her job because of it. After countless job applications and not even getting an interview, depression set in. It made me feel really worthless. Um, no belief in myself. My confidence was right at the bottom. It was, it was a horrible place to be. Comparing herself to friends and checking social media made Alana feel isolated. They had like good jobs and they had like partners and it was just really hard because I saw that as their perfect life and me sort of telling them about what was going on. The fear is there where whoever you talk to, are they going to understand? Um, are you going to, is it going to be said that you're an attention seeker for this or that nothing's really wrong because you can't see it from the outside? New research out today by the Prince's Trust finds nearly 50% of young people have felt the same as Alana. We found that half of young people have experienced mental health issues, yet a third of them won't talk to anyone about them. And 70% think it's a real stigma and will stop them getting a job or moving on in life. It was after getting on the Trust's trainee scheme in Fraser's that gave the 25-year-old her confidence back. Try not to let the smallest things annoy you. Um, if you can, try and pull yourself away from social media. Don't use it as much as what you usually would. Um, don't compare yourself to what's out there and what's round about you and what everybody else has got. She's stopped doing that and is thinking of a long-term career here. Suzanne Allen, reporting Scotland, Glasgow. AG Bar, the maker of Iron Brew, is cutting the amount of sugar in its famous amber fizzy drink. The company says it's been influenced by consumer demand more than the tax on sugary drinks due to come in next year. Aileen Clark reports. That was the original label there. This isn't the first time sugar has been reduced in Iron Brew, but the previous occasion was in the 1940s when the nation was at war. When sugar became so scarce that in fact uh, one had to use part sugar and part saccharin as the sweetening uh, of the drink. The company says today it's reacting to consumer demand. The level of reduction having the sugar content though is influenced by the sugar tax coming in next year. It seems sensible to bring it just below the level at which taxation would commence uh, and therefore our, our consumers would not be subjected to uh, additional cost uh, when the sugar tax comes in. So by the autumn there should be quite a bit less sugar in this sugary drink. So we carried out our own bit of market research to find out what people think of that here in Govan in Glasgow. Well that's been a good idea because the kids are swallowing that stuff after well, 100 mile an hour, some of them, you know, but should have done that years ago. I would still drink it. As long as the taste was, was still there, I would still drink it, yep, definitely. But is it a now and again thing rather than an everyday thing? Well, it's an everyday thing for me, for me. I know for the kids right enough. Even half the sugar is still quite high, so I, I still don't think that that's enough. And I think the only way to make sure you're not getting sugar is not to have any fizzy drinks at all. Barr's decision has been welcomed, but it's not going to solve Scotland's love affair with sugar, says this expert. It means roughly 70 less calories per can or four spoonfuls of sugar, which is excellent. That will definitely protect the teeth. It will certainly help reduce the levels of refined sugar intake and therefore might help obesity, but it's not the silver bullet for obesity by any means. I'm sleeping on an iron brew. Barr insists that the less sugar drink will taste the same as it does now. Any effect on the sales of their sugar-free versions will be interesting to watch. Aileen Clark, reporting Scotland. Well, she's always sugary sweet. It's over to Kirsteen <laughs> for the forecast. <laughs> Thank you very much, Katrina. Good evening to provisional statistics from the Met Office regarding winter 2016-17.
tell us that it has been drier and milder than average. And indeed, in terms of sunshine across Scotland, well, the northwest of Scotland, the only region in the whole of the UK seeing more sunshine than average. Indeed, potentially the fourth mildest winter on record in Scotland. Certainly today, for the beginning of the meteorological spring, sunshine hasn't been in short supply. We have had a scattering of showers, however, and these will become heavier and more frequent across the Northern and Western Isles tonight, the Northwest Highlands, a wintry flavour at times and west or northwesterly winds increasing as we go through the night. We may also have some icy stretches on untreated roads and surfaces, otherwise though dry with clear spells and a fairly widespread frost developing with temperatures dipping to around minus two or minus three Celsius. So tomorrow looks like a fairly bright and breezy day. Showers, especially across the northwest tomorrow morning, although with these brisk westerly winds, some showers will reach central and eastern areas as we go through the day. So taking a closer look around three o'clock tomorrow, a scattering of showers affecting southern, central and eastern areas. Most of the showers, however, will be across the northwest highlands and up towards the Northern Isles. Again, wintry in nature, especially over the hills and high ground, with a mixture of rain and sleet to low levels. However, there will be plenty of brightness and sunshine in between the showers. Highs of 7 or 8 Celsius tomorrow, although feeling colder, especially in exposure to these brisk westerly winds. Tomorrow evening, we continue to see a few showers at times. However, there will be some clear spells, a fairly widespread frost again, and a risk of ice on any untreated roads and surfaces. More in the way of more organised rain, however, coming into the far southwest. For Friday, it looks largely dry and bright, just a few showers across the far north, plenty of sunshine, although clouding over from the south in the afternoon and feeling relatively mild. That's the forecast, Katrina. Thanks very much for that, Kirstine. And that's Reporting Scotland. I'll be back with the late bulletin just after the 10 o'clock news. Until then, though, from everybody on the team right across the country, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.